Dennis Chang here and that was my buddy Will Dickerson that you just heard here. I usually start off these videos with my own playing but there's a reason I posted his playing and we'll get to that at the very end. As usual before we start it would be greatly appreciated if you like, subscribe, share, comment, all that stuff because it actually makes a huge difference in the way the YouTube algorithm promotes videos therefore allows me to make a little bit of money because all these videos that I make for free take quite a bit of time to make and I think the content's pretty good <laughs> so all this stuff is free and for some reason if you feel like supporting me financially that would be of course very appreciated but I don't ask money for nothing you can go on my DC Music School site see if there's anything that interests you or if you play Gypsy Jazz and you're a beginner, I've just released Volume 3 of my Gypsy Jazz Beginner Series. I, of course, I would suggest you start with Volume 1 and then 2. Um, you'll have all the links in the description box. As you guys have noticed, most of my videos are quite long. It's because I don't believe in shortcuts and I don't believe in black and white. Everything is always nuanced and I try to get real, go really in depth with all these topics. So today's topic will be about practicing. And you guys will forgive me if it looks like I'm reading a script. I'm not reading a script. I'm reading lots of notes that I made because it took me a lot of time to organize my thoughts when it comes to practicing. I get a lot of emails and I just got one the other day asking me to make a video on practicing. So here it is. So how to practice and my practice philosophies. My philosophies are constantly evolving over time due to experience and all the people that I've encountered over the years. It's something that I thought about my entire life, my entire musical playing life. And a lot of it has changed um, due to the aforementioned experiences. I would say that with uh, time, my views on music and practicing have become a lot more philo philosophical and more open-minded than they used to be when I was starting out. As many of you know, because of my career as a musician and owner of DC Music School, I've had lots of opportunities to work with many of the best players in the world and even spend a lot of time with them. So basically I want to share with you some of my observations. The topic of practicing is a huge topic and I think instead of doing some, a massively long video where I can easily pop like talk for two or three hours, maybe four hours, today I'll focus on something much more specific. And basically today's topic will be on the philosophical and psychological ideas as, it relate, as they relate to practicing. Basically, the number one question I get is how to practice more efficiently in order to grow as fast as possible. That's basically what everyone wants, myself included. And before answering that question, I think it's quite important to ask why we even play music in the first place and why do we even practice. Does it bring us joy? So the first thing that I actually want to address is our mental health and our sense of happiness. And it's something, it seems stupid to talk about, but it's something that can be easily overlooked, especially for those of us who are pursuing uh, a professional, professional career as a musician or at least trying to. I know so many musicians who struggle with uh, depression due to a lot of reasons, sometimes related to the actual playing, the music, sometimes it's the difficulty of life as a musician, you know, the financial aspects and all that stuff. Um, here, I'm mainly talking about the, the playing aspect. And I think this can be stressed enough, but when it comes to music, it should always bring us some form of joy, happiness, or comfort. Or maybe, you know, you're sad, feeling a little depressed because you went through a big breakup or... Um, they canceled your favorite TV show and you decide to focus a lot on music and so maybe it doesn't bring you joy per se but it brings you comfort in a sense it's a form of therapy for you while we are in practice mode obviously we want to see improvement however psychologically speaking I think we shouldn't obsessively focus on the results and rather just enjoy the process as it happens. And I know that this is easier said than done, but I realized for myself, 
it was often much health, healthier not to be concerned with whether I was actually improving or not, but just to enjoy the moment while I was practicing or playing. It's really a psychological mindset. Of course, when I'm practicing, I'm very focused on practicing efficiently and correctly, but this mindset, it's like I'm not obsessed about any kind of immediate results. And uh, I just enjoy the moment. And sooner or later, like a few weeks or a few months later, I do notice some kind of improvement. And that's, I think, the, the best state that you can be in. Now, if there's one thing in common with all the monster musicians that I've met over the past 20 years, it's that they have this intense burning passion uh, they have or had in their formative, formative years. And this kind of passion, this obsession, if you will, is what made them want to play or practice all the time every waking moment some of the musicians that i know personally they played all day every day for a number of years if they weren't playing or practicing they were thinking about it so you see such players are not concerned with the number of hours they should be practicing or anything like that it's basically they pick up the instrument and they just can't stop it's not like all right i'm going to practice one hour of scales one hour of arpeggios 30 minutes on your train no it's just they grab it and it's self-guided it just pure joy from the minute they pick up the instrument to the moment they put it down because they have to go to sleep or something. So to give you an example among the people that I know personally is uh, Birelli Legren. And if you don't know who he is, look him up. He's one of the most talented guitar players of our times. Anyway, when he was four years old, he told me he started uh, the guitar pretty seriously when he was four years old. He was already passionate about it. This, the, the day he picked it up and within a few months he was already like playing Django solos like in a beginner way of course uh, he spent his entire days lifting Django solos on his record player he'd do this so often that he actually break the records and his dad or brother I forgot who it was would have to go to the store to get him a new record all day all day he'd be lifting Django solos and having a blast all the other the older musicians would uh, when they when they came home from work or school, the Birelli told me they'd often go over to his house to see what he had learned that day, and it was like that for many years. That's the exact same thing with uh, Jimmy Rosenberg, another child prodigy. He he told me he was just locked in his practice room all day, every day, doing the exact same thing. Stokola Rosenberg, same thing. Samson Schmidt, he was telling me about back in the day, it was not records, vinyl, but actual cassettes, Django cassettes. So he had to stop and rewind all day. They were doing that. To change styles, we'll talk about also uh, Pat Martino, with whom I did some work. He told me the same thing. It's just this intense, intense love for music. And they once they grab their instrument, they just can't stop. They just practice all day, play all day. Play is practice. Practice is play. You know, there's a difference between liking music, just listening casually, la la la, you know, have fun, put it in one ear, out the other, and then this kind of insatiable thirst for it. And okay, maybe you can argue that it's psychologically unhealthy to be this obsessed. Who knows? Maybe it's true. But all I can say is screw you. We're having fun doing it. And this is our life. This, this is what it is. And they all had this in common. And yes, indeed, I realize that this is really the extreme side of it. But you don't necessarily have to be that obsessed. The point I want to make is, though, is that whenever you're playing music, you should always have this, this kind of joy that I'm talking about. And you always have to come back to this joy of, love, of loving music for the sake of loving music. You practice, not because you have to, but because you can't have it any other way. And that's probably the best uh, psychological state there is when it comes to practicing. So with all these players that I mentioned earlier, and I'm using these names because these are people that I know personally, that I've had uh, extensive, I spent time with getting to know them. Well, these people, they weren't asking themselves, okay, what should I practice today? Should I do 30 minutes of scales, 30 minutes of arpeggios, 20 minutes of blah, 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 blah. No, for them, it was the passion for the music of Django Reinhardt in the beginning. They spent hours listening to his music and absorbing the language. And they did whatever it took for them, whatever it took for them to uh, absorb this language. 
So in this case, we have something very specific. It's the music of Django Reinhardt. And then, if it's the music of Django Reinhardt, we already have a clear path ahead of us. We know what we want to practice. We want to practice to be able to play that style, which means repertoire. And this relates to what I said earlier about asking yourself why you even practice and why you even play music. This is very important because a lot of us play music, but often without any kind of direction. And actually, that was the case for me before I discovered Django uh, right after high school. I remember being very obsessed with the guitar before that. But I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with music or the guitar. And I, I, went to, um, I went and took lessons with people who taught me scales, arpeggios, theory, all the standard thing that you're likely to encounter when you go to your average guitar teacher out there. So, you know, these teachers would tell me to practice modes over these tunes. Uh, all of this was assigned to me, practice this. And I did practice those things. But I didn't really use any of those things in a realistic situation. And actually in those days, I did practice all day. I remember like during uh, when there was no school, I'd practice 6 to 10 hours a day. But without any kind of direction, these 10 hours, in my opinion, were a complete waste. I didn't know any better until the day that I discovered Django. From Django, I discovered uh, three guitarists, Rafael Faiz, Stokola Rosenberg, and Jimmy Rosenberg. Uh, in those days, Birelli wasn't playing gypsy jazz yet, and he hadn't done, uh, well, he wasn't playing gypsy jazz anymore, and he hadn't done his uh, gypsy project album yet. And then I got this VHS of a documentary called Django Legacy, and I discovered a few more players. But basically, I fell so deeply in love with this music. It was just a light that came up in my head, and I knew right away this is what I wanted to do. So that happened, and I suddenly saw the path before me. And for the first time in my life, there was a sense of direction. The first step was to learn the tunes. So now there was actually something to practice. And then which tunes? And it was very simple. Basically the ones that I heard and that I liked. Nothing was forced on me. Like no one told me, you should learn this song or that song. It's more like I heard this song. I remember Minor Swing was the first one. It's like, wow, this blew my mind. I had to learn it. And in those days, my ears were not so developed. And so it was mainly the easier songs, stuff that was pretty catchy, like Minor Swing, Dark Eyes, Minor Blues. Those were some of the first tunes that I remember. And in fact, Pat Martino told me a story about when he was a kid, and the only thing he wanted to play was stuff like... That kind of really simple stuff. It was the same for him. His ears were not developed them. So in the beginning, we, we go for what we like. It's often the really simple stuff. And of course, as our ears become more refined, we tend to crave more sophisticated music. For me personally, I'm uh, often happy to play the, the simple tunes. For me, the, the complexity of the song isn't so important as long as it's well played, as long as the music is beautiful and it's well executed. So going back to my story again, uh, in those days, there was only one other guy playing the Django style, my friend Francois Rousseau in Montreal. And every Sunday, he played uh, this music in a cafe with some other people who had also gone into this style a little bit before I did. So every single Sunday, I remember going to see them play. And this is how I uh, discovered some of the, my first tunes. Some of them were part of the so-called Gypsy Jazz standard repertoire. Like All of Me, After You've Gone, Nuage, stuff like that. And others were a bit more obscure, like La Foule or Les Copains d'Abord, which are, which are songs that are popular in, in, in French culture, but not necessarily so in the, in the jazz or gypsy jazz repertoire. So I do remember making notes of these songs, and um, I started learning these songs. And I remember it was mainly a lot of just the chords, playing the rhythm, because I wasn't feeling confident about playing lead yet. And sometimes I'd bring my guitar on those Sundays, and my buddies would like, invite me to just play rhythm to sit in and sometimes even solo I remember that and it was it was lots of fun so there was this like direction already learning the songs playing the chords learning uh, the chords being able to play the rhythm no one imposed a repertoire on me I chose those songs because I love them and because people were playing them so I thought okay if I want to join these uh, join these guys even if it's just on rhythm then I should learn some of those tunes my example is the exact same with all the players that I mentioned previously. 
It's like their desire to learn whatever repertoire they learned was based on their personal desires, their personal, uh, their personal desire to learn those songs. And this is in stark contrast with what I would call imposed repertoire that you might not necessarily like. And this is very common when you go to, when you take lessons with, at a music school or with a, with a teacher. The teacher tells you, okay, you need to learn Autumn Leaves, you need to learn all the things you are, Blue Bossa, whatever. And in this case, actually, personally, I remember this. I actually did enjoy Autumn Leaves. I did enjoy Blue Bossa because those melodies were quite simple. But it was all imposed. The major difference between these two situations is that in the first situation, you've heard the tunes already and you fell in love with them. The second situation is someone introducing you to music, uh, telling you to learn a tune that you've never heard. Maybe they don't even make you listen to it. They just teach it to you. Like they give you the sheet music here learn autumn leaves and maybe you do love it love it and in which case that's great but if you don't then it's often harder to find the motivation to do something you don't enjoy so in that first situation you've heard probably heard the song so many times it's already stuck in your ear it makes it so much easier to learn and a whole lot more fun as well so i mentioned that in those days my ears were not so advanced compared to what they are today and in those days I remember I, I did respect things like uh, bebop, but it wasn't easy for me to listen to, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because my ears just didn't understand the structure, the culture, and the vocabulary. So there were songs like Autumn Leaves that I, that I did like, but I would listen to bebop players play it, and I, I didn't get it. I just didn't know how to get into it. it was, so there, there was no path for me to absorb that. On the other hand, in this gypsy jazz style with tunes like Dark Eyes, All of Me, and especially the way that they were playing it, it was much easier for my ears to understand what was going on and much easier for me to absorb. Of course, my, nowadays my ears are so much more refined and I understand the bebop language quite well and now I love listening to bebop players. The point that I want to make with such a statement is that um, maybe you don't enjoy something right away, but give it time and maybe come back to it later when your ears have improved. If you still don't enjoy it, then it's absolutely no problem, but at least you'll have uh, given it a chance. And why do I say this? Because all the players that I mentioned previously, they all had or have still have this uncontrollable urge to play and practice. But some players evolve more than others. Now when I say evolve, I want to be very careful with my uh, terminology here. I don't want to trigger you people. <laughs> Who do you mean, you people? When I say evolve, it does not mean that they are better at making music from an artistic point of view. Someone with practically no technique and limited vocabulary can make music that's on par or even better than someone who has the most advanced ears and technique. For example, I love the Beatles. Um, I like, when I was a kid, I mean, I enjoy the music of, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Eric Clapton, Carlos Santana, they don't have the most insane technique or the most sophisticated music out there, but I think they play quite well and I'd rather listen to them than someone who can do the most craziest thing and over the most complicated songs. And I do listen to these players, these simple players. The artistic thing is subjective, but there is no doubt that some musicians are more capable in terms of ears, harmonic sophistication, technique, etc. All such things are quantifiable. Birelli Lagren is one of these players who has tremendous technical facility on the acoustic guitar, on the electric guitar, on electric bass, on double bass. And at one point in his life, he was also very advanced on the violin, but he hasn't been playing in a while, he told me. He was born into the uh, gypsy culture, the gypsy tribe that Django Reinhardt was part of. We call this the Sinti tribe, Manush. That's another word. And so he grew up with the music of Django. Uh, he started playing music very seriously from the get-go since the age of four. By the time he was 13 or 14, he'd had like nine, ten years of like practicing ten hours a day this kind of music. And at that point, he was thirsting for something more. He even considered putting away his guitar to become a full-time electric bassist, if you believe that. I know he did pursue the electric bass very, very seriously, playing fusion and jazz rock. Um, but 
Of course, he still came back to the guitar professionally. For almost 20 years, he practically stopped playing this so-called gypsy jazz and was exploring so many different styles of jazz, from bebop to jazz rock, like fusion, and even some rock guitar and different things, blues. He didn't do this because someone told him to learn those styles. He did it because he thirsted for something beyond the Django that he grew up with. And so he discovered all these styles that he fell in love with and he absorbed them. All these other instruments and styles of music that he learned, they came from his own personal desire to learn them. Angelo Dabar is someone else that I know. He always continued in the Django tradition. He was born into the same tribe as uh, Birelli and he played the Django style in his own way and at one point in his teenage years he uh, discovered Eastern European music and also went in that direction. So his style is a fusion of Django style and also Eastern European music. Stokel or Rosenberg likewise stayed in the Django tri tradition for the most part but then discovered things that were a little bit more Latin oriented and the Rosenberg trio is is the, the, the group that popularized what is called the Gypsy Bassa. Basically, all these musicians were following a very, very natural path based on their interests. Now, it so happens that Birelli's natural path had the most uh, payoff in terms of overall musical development. And that's why when Birelli came back to the music of Django Reinhardt, he practically, he single-handedly revolutionized the way people approach uh, Gypsy Jazz. He showed everyone that it was possible to mix all these modern influences while still being faithful to the tradition. And some of these uh, modern influences are very harmonically advanced. So what I'm advocating for is for you to find the most natural path possible, the one that brings you the most joy. I'm not saying that there's never a moment where you don't force yourself to do something. Of course, such moments will occur. The big difference is that one is a natural lifestyle, a natural routine. And the other is a routine that you force yourself to do because you have to do it for, for some reason. And such routines can be maintained for a long time, maybe even years. But most of the time, at one point, it just stops. It's very difficult to maintain. It's kind of like a diet. I think many of experts have concluded that diets don't work. Lifestyle change, a complete lifestyle change is what you need to adopt and it has to feel natural. I guess it's also a question of semantics what is con considered a natural routine and what is considered a forced routine. A lot of these players that I mentioned uh, no longer practice the same way they did when they were younger. Some don't even practice anymore. And the result is that they, they do stop evolving. And the, every, we have our reasons for this. Family life, or we feel that we're okay with where we're at. It's that we all have our reasons for playing music. Like I said, forced routines are like diets. They can only work for so long. A lifestyle, an entire lifestyle that you can maintain and that feels natural is ideal. How do you develop such a lifestyle? And that's the biggest mess, that's the big mystery, isn't it? It's uh, not easy. And I suppose it requires tremendous willpower before it even starts to feel natural. Now I do know some players, musicians, who achieved a very high level of musicianship through forced routines like maybe from the parents, from the school, or even they told themselves they had to do it. But eventually some of these players, I noticed they faced um, certain mental health issues, severe depression, anxiety, anger. So while it is possible for you to, to force yourself to do something to achieve results, I would, you know, caution against doing too much of that. Because in my opinion, in the end, your happiness is very important. It's a spectrum. Of course, you want things to be as natural as possible, but every now and then, of course, you can force yourself to do something. Again, I want to be clear that I'm not talking about artistry, but about acquiring new skills. It's perfectly normal at one point to start to settle into something and where we can ease the, 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 the practicing lifestyle. For example, B.B. King's sole musical interest was playing the blues music that he played. Yngwie Malmsteen, you can see that if you follow his music, his guitar playing, he pretty much stopped evol evolving in terms of skills uh, by the time he reaches early 20s. Angelo Dabar's guitar skills haven't evolved since he was in his 20s either. Same thing with Stokolo Rosenberg, etc., etc. It's, it's perfectly normal. So when it comes to evolution, 
And again, I'm not talking about artistic evolution. That's entirely subjective. But there are, in my opinion, two kinds of evolution, two kinds of growth. There's what I call mechanical evolution and stylistic evolution. Mechanical is often related to technique, acquiring new skills or techniques. And that's why a lot of these players that I mentioned earlier, they, they stopped evolving fairly early on. Because from there on, they focused more on the artistic side of things with the, the mechanical tools that they had uh, achieved for themselves. The example that I like to use the most would be Birelli Lagren, who had gone extremely, who reached an extremely advanced level of acoustic guitar technique as it relates to the Django style. By the time he was 12, 12 years old. By the time he was 12 years old, he had been playing like 10 hours a day for eight years. However, he had not yet developed the electric guitar touch. And around then, he started experimenting with solid body guitars and with the modern electric guitar technique. And then he worked hard and he acquired that technique. Nowadays, when he plays, he's often mixing both techniques. Players like Angelo Debar or Stokola Rosenberg only have that one technique that they started with. That's to give you another example. Basically, with this one technique that they have, it's to play the lines that they want to play and that can be played mainly with this technique, easily played with this technique. Birelli, on the other hand, he had to develop a different technique because he wanted to play lines that were easier to play with the other technique, play very idiomatic electric guitar lines. He also, since he played electric bass, he also developed some slapping, guitar te slapping techniques that he applies to guitar as well. From a mechanical point of view, I would say that Birelli, as far as the guitar is concerned, stopped evolving maybe sometime in his mid to late 20s. But by that time, he had acquired a far wider range of skills than most guitarists. Because he had the acoustic guitar technique, the Django like floating hand technique, rest stroke, whatever you want to call it, the electric, modern electric guitar technique, uh, incorporating percussive elements on the guitar from the bass, from his bass playing. Things like that. Very few players have this wide range of technical tools available to them. But if, for example, Birelli wanted to continue to develop his mechanical um, skills on the guitar, he would, for example, have to start exploring things like intricate, intricate uh, sweep guitar techniques like frangambali, or develop some sort of finger picking, like advanced finger picking skills because his are relatively basic, or hybrid picking, or like some kind of advanced tapping and all that stuff. The sky's the limit, but he doesn't. Why not? Because he doesn't feel the need to do these things unless the music he wants to play requires it. Like the jazz fusion thing required a different set of techniques that the Django technique didn't do. So he adapted. So this video isn't about how to practice technique. I'll make a different in-depth video de dedicated to that topic alone. But for me personally, and for a lot of the top players, technique development was intrinsically tied to the music that these players wanted to play. If you want to play authentic bluegrass lines, then you need to de develop the technique you need to play those lines. That means a lot of stuff in first position using open strings and a lot of alternate picking. Ingves Malmsteen's technique came naturally as a result of the lines that he wanted to play. Same goes for B.B. King. Same goes for uh, Frank Gambali, who really wanted to develop a uh, a very sophisticated way of playing uh, intervallic lines. So he developed this sweep picking technique that he's very famous for. Alan Holdsworth developed his whole stretchy legato thing. Uh, Scott Anderson, I think that's the name, is this country guitar player, Western Swing. He has this incredible hybrid technique and it's, uh, that allows him to play the lines that he plays. The list goes on. These people develop their technique not for the sake of developing technique but for the sake of playing the music that they want to play and that's that's a key thing to 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 take away from uh technical practice so again i'll make one day i'll make a video on practicing technique so the next one is stylistic growth stylistic evolution which is about doing what it takes to develop the skills to play the music that we want to play so as I said earlier, a lot of this does tie in with, um, with the technique because we want to develop the technique to be able to play this style. But to be more um, precise, we're talking here about 
vocabulary, artistic understanding of how to execute the sound, and things like that. So certain styles have improvisation and others don't. Nowadays, classical music, for the most part, doesn't require improvisation. So it's more about understanding the music and then developing the technique to achieve the interpretation that you decided to come up with, that you decided for that particular piece. So in this case, this artistic evolution is very much related to technique. Now, technique doesn't mean just dexterity or speed, but technique in a broader sense. Dynamics, sound, vibrato. On the guitar, you know, if I'm playing a melody, I can play it so many different ways, and it all falls under the realm of technique. I can play like this. Or I can do it here. Ah. Uh. So that was like, I don't know how many ways. I varied the right hand, the attack, the duration of the left hand, the timing, the ornaments, and all that stuff. That kind of a technical workout, I think, is very important. Sound. Everything is in the service of the music. So I, I try not to develop technique for the sake of technique. It's always in service of the music. But then there are certain styles that have improvisation. And in the context of improvisation, you want to have a firm understanding of the genre you want to play. If the music is based on a tradition, then it's likely that you will want to absorb that tradition. That means you have to listen to the music a lot, but ideally also go out and make friends with uh, the people, the practitioners of that style. And that's why some people move to Ireland to study Celtic music. Uh, I met some people in Japan and Taiwan who went to the USA to meet bluegrass players. Uh, I know lots of people in gypsy jazz move to France because of their love for, for that style of music. That's not always possible, right? But you can also attend festivals. And meeting these people, in my opinion, is a form of practicing as well. Because you are inspiring each other, you're, you're hearing things firsthand, uh, you're discovering what they're working on, what they're playing, the tunes that they're playing, the kinds of lines that they play. It's kind of osmosis. You jam with them. And by playing with different musicians, you are often out of your comfort zone and it shows you, you know, how much, what, what, where you stand. You're comparing yourself to other musicians, not from a competitive point of view, but just to see, okay, that's what they're doing, well, this is what I'm doing, hmm, do I want to do what they're doing, and etc. The community is a very, it's, it's, it's a big thing. and It helps a lot. It's not, I wouldn't say that it's like, 100% necessary, but it does make a huge difference to be involved with the community as much as possible. And if you don't believe it, there's a reason why a lot of the best trad jazz players live in New Orleans, why a lot of the best modern jazz players are in New York, where a lot of the best uh, traditional Chinese music players live in China. All community, community, inspiring each other, pushing each other to grow. Now, of course, Nowadays, with the uh, recordings and the internet, we can also learn a lot of the voc vocabulary from the comfort of our own home. But the skills that you develop from meeting high-level players in the community, that, that cannot be simulated. So I can't recommend this highly enough. This is a thing that I call living the life. Live the life. It's about adopting a lifestyle that automatically allows you to grow. I talk a lot about this, uh, this concept, living the life, in a lot of my previous videos. So I actually suggest that you watch many of my previous videos. I know they're long, but the content is great. So in order to adopt this lifestyle, this live the life lifestyle, you have to um, develop certain skills. I talked a lot about these uh, skills in some of my more recent videos. So there's the ability to figure out music by ear, the ability to understand what's going on in the music, and that doesn't necessarily mean like complicated theory. And there's the ability to observe and mimic, visually observe something and then be able to mimic. Uh, that last one is, applies to visual instruments like the guitar or piano or violin. I uh, briefly address these skills in my most recent videos, but I, as I said in those videos, I'll also one day make an in-depth video 
on how to acquire these skills. So this would fall under the question of how to practice. But this is the thing. These skills can be learned and can be trained to reach a high level. Some people naturally have it already. And if that's your case, congratulations. But if not, it's not your case, then I guarantee you that uh, it is possible to acquire these skills. When it comes to stylistic evolution, this is the single uh, skill set that will allow you to continuously grow automatically. This skill allows you to listen to music without an instrument in your hands and to hear something and just understand it. And then you grab your instrument and you can reproduce the same idea with minimal practice. Unless of course it's super, super technical, then of course you spend the time it takes to be able to physically uh, achieve it. Just the other day I heard this thing. I heard it in my ear and I was already able to hear, I was able to hear this sus sound and I heard this. And then I heard, I could hear that it's just um, da, 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 da. And then I grab my instrument, I put everything together, and it's actually technically challenging. So I practice it for, well, I, I haven't practiced it in a while, I just did that one time. I maybe practice it for 10 minutes, because in the beginning it was like, ah. And then. And now I have, well, that wasn't perfect. I see I can still put a bit more time. The point I'm making though is I heard it once or twice and then I grab my instrument, boom. And this is a result of living the life. This is a skill that Birelli Lagren has to a very, very high level. Even though he doesn't practice anymore, much anyway, uh, and he's in his early 50s now. Every year, he, every time he does a concert, there's a new video on YouTube where I see him. I always see him evolving as an improviser. He always has new ideas, new lines. He's always developing new ideas in his head because he can hear things in his head and reproduce them on the guitar or he can hear something and immediately grab it. His vocabulary continues to expand even to this day without making any kind of effort. It just happens because he has this skill. This is the uh, stylistic growth that I'm talking about. Now, I won't compare myself to Birelli to I'm not saying that I'm of the same level, like really far from it. But I have adopted the same lifestyle and as have many players. And because I've adopted this lifestyle, I'm always developing my vocabulary just by listening to music, different kinds of music. I'm always absorbing new ideas. And for those who, of you who know me personally, you know that I haven't played guitar in three years. I only use the guitar to teach or when people ask me to do concerts. And the reason for that is because the past three years I've been focusing full time on practicing the violin and a bit of double bass. Except for here in Taiwan, I don't have my bass. I miss, I miss my bass. So I stopped practicing guitar, but if you hear me play every year, uh, my vocabulary is always changing and evolving. Now evolving doesn't mean that it's getting better, but I have always have new ideas up my sleeves. My vocabulary on the guitar continues to expand without putting any effort whatsoever. Uh, lately I've been listening to Wes Montgomery and let's say we're in the key of D minor and we have an e A7 chord. I heard Wes Montgomery do this chord and I heard oh cool that's that sound. I, I, I recognize that sound but it's a bit strange in the context of A7 in the key of D minor but it's a cool sound. It's, that's a Wes Montgomery sound and then in my head I came up with this line. D minor without practicing on the guitar it just comes naturally so basically for a stylistic growth this skill skill set allows you to improve simply by listening to music and practicing in your own head and I often use the analog analogy of language all of us have at least one mother tongue that we're extremely familiar with and we're so familiar with it that we have develop this kind of intrinsic understanding of how the language works so that when we encounter new words it's not often not difficult for us to learn these new words in fact recently in the english language i uh, discovered a new word i, I encountered it many times i didn't know what it mean, meant it's the word uh, furlough i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly furlough which basically because it's related to the corona uh, pandemic 
a lot of people were furloughed. Basically, they have this leave of absence because they can't work due to the virus. So anyway, uh, it was very easy for me to learn the word. I understood the content. I actually kind of had an idea of what it meant because of the way it was written in the context. But I looked it up in the dictionary and it confirmed my suspicions. That means this leave of absence. By the way, English isn't my, uh, isn't my first language. I learned to speak English by watching American TV and playing uh, video games in English. <laughs> so video games weren't a waste of time, mom. Now you compare this to someone who, whose la first language, who doesn't speak English or is studying English. I think um, they're already struggling to, struggling to understand how the language works. And so they would probably have a much harder time learning this word than I did. As some of you know, I have been studying the Japanese language for over a year now. A year and like four months or so and it was the same although I'm still a beginner I have evolved a lot since I started uh, I'm really still a beginner and there's still so much I don't know about the language when it comes to understanding its inner workings the grammar but I do know quite a lot and with what I know in the context of what I know I'm still able to learn new words just by hearing them and sometimes looking them up uh, online let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. When I went to Tokyo, um, I often encountered this word, shaberu. I heard this word so many times, and it means to speak. And the word that I, I was taught formally through lessons was hanasu, which also means to speak. And from what I understand, these two words mean the same thing, are often interchangeable, but there are some instances where you maybe one use one over the other. But that's beyond the point. But um, the first time I encountered this word, shaberu, it wasn't in this form. I encountered in the form of... Uh, it, shaberu would be what we could call the dictionary form, the infinitive form in, in English. I heard it conjugated because someone was asking me if I spoke Japanese and then in Japanese when you're speaking to someone people can talk to you in two ways they can speak to you casually or formally and I've heard both so casually they'd say shabereru can you speak or shaberemasu ka same thing and because I knew these two forms like the maska and the the, the 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 I don't know what you call this form but the the, the ability can you speak I knew how this grammar point so I knew how to take this word shabereru, this conjugated form, and I was able to come up with the infinitive form just because I know how that aspect of Japanese grammar worked. And there's still lots of grammatical situations that I haven't mastered yet in Japanese, but for those that I'm familiar with, I'm basically able to learn new words or understand certain meanings just by encountering them or understand, looking at the context. And a few weeks ago, I went to see a movie that was 100% in Japanese, no, no English subtitles. And I managed to understand about 70% of it. Um, I understood the whole plot. There were just some finer nuances that I didn't get. And actually, there were a lot of words that I didn't understand. But the context of a lot of the words that I do, did understand allowed me to understand the overall meaning. It's kind of like the word furlough. The context of that word allowed me to guess what it meant. So that's the thing with living the life. I'm so experienced with jazz, the inner workings of jazz, that there's some new things that, like that West Montgomery chord. This chord on itself, I knew, I've, I, I know what it is. E minor 11. I've heard it in the context of E minor 11, but I heard it over an A7 chord in minor key. And then suddenly, I made the connection. And I grabbed my guitar, boom. So it's the same, it's the, it's the same exact analogy. So based on my Japanese example, living the life isn't just one thing. It's actually a spectrum. Meaning that the more that I understand about Japanese grammar, the more I can naturally evolve. Right now, as far as the Japanese language is concerned, I can only evolve, evolve within the sphere of uh, Japanese grammar that I've currently mastered. And if I either master other forms, there are these like if forms, like that I still have, I'm working on, then I'll be able to, you know, expand that way. Like I said, in the beginning, um, so in music, it was the same thing. In the beginning, bebop was very difficult for me to understand. I just didn't get it. 
but because of the music of Django, I gradually and naturally acquired the skills to hear and understand bebop. When I hear altered, I understand them. When I hear diminished, I hear it. I hear basic chord progressions very easily, like two, five, one. In fact, yesterday I went to a jam session. They were playing, I think, I Remember You. Yeah, that was a tune they were playing. I didn't know it, and I was listening to the piano and the bass player, and I was able to get like 80% of the song. It was just the ending that I wasn't clear on. Uh, because I'm so heavily immersed in old jazz music, I'm just so very familiar with the inner workings of the music. I can hear most old songs just once or twice and just understand it right away. For instance, if I'm learning a song in the swing style, if I hear a melody line that lasts eight bars, then I can almost safely assume that it's A, A, B, A form. And the second and third A's are often similar or similar enough. If I'm playing a song that's in two parts, like Swing Giton, Da 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 di da 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 da. Okay, um, and I see that at the end of the first part, there's this long two chord A7, then D7 chord. I can, based on experience, I can safely assume that the ending would be the same thing but shorter. A7, D7, G minor resolution. This is what I mean about like experience and knowledge of the inner workings of the style. It's comparable to my Japanese analogy. If you know how the potential form works, if you know how the past tense works, then you can learn all sorts of verbs within the past tense world. Since I'm so familiar with swing music, I know everything about, I can guess how most songs are going to work. In a general sense, therefore, you should be practicing what you want to practice. If you want to practice bluegrass, sorry, if you want to play bluegrass, you need to practice bluegrass. If you want to play gypsy jazz, you need to practice gypsy jazz. Therefore, you need to spend time learning repertoire. I've said this in so many videos already. Learn the chords of the song, learn the structure, and then if possible, learn as much of the melody as you can. Because not all recordings play the full melody, so you basically get what you can, at least the main parts. As you keep learning songs, you begin to see what the common elements are, the common chord progressions, the common structures, the, the common tendencies. Now, which songs should you learn? The ones you like, for starters. But also in the case of Gypsy Jazz, since it's a community-based style, where it's very common to get together with people and jam, um, if there is a small community in your home time, ta home town, ah, home town, then try to seek them out and these these players out and get together to play tunes and learn together. Ideally, uh, the ideal situation would be able to sit in with players who are more experienced than you, but that's not always possible. But that's also why you have festivals. If there's already a scene where you live, check out the songs that they play. If you want to jam with them, then you know you'd have to learn their tunes. Now this question does come up. What if I don't like the tunes that they play? This and this, at this point I want to quote a modified version of uh, Isaac Newton's third law. Something like, for every reaction, for every, sorry, for every action there's a reaction. The the modified th version for me would be every decision that you make there will be a consequence like someone actually i remember this i made up this uh this saying early on in my teenage years because i remember when i was a teenager I, I all i wanted to do was practice guitar and i remember i lost a lot of friends because they would invite me to go out and hang but i just said no i'm gonna practice and so i made this decision to practice I raised my guitar skill levels, but I lost friends. On the other hand, if I had gone to hang out with friends, we'd probably still be friends today, but I wouldn't have raised my guitar skills. So you make a choice and you accept the consequences. So if you don't like the songs that people in your community are playing, then of course, you don't have to learn them. That's totally fine. But the result is then you have no one to play with. That is perfectly okay, because ideally, ideally you should only play the music that you like. But be aware that the less that you like, the more limited your chances are. It goes back to what I said in the beginning. I firmly believe in the importance of finding joy in all that you do musically, especially so if you're a hobby musician. I mean, I'd say the same thing for professional or aspiring professional musicians as well. But if you're a hobbyist, why would you torture yourself for your hobby? I've met people who told me they didn't enjoy practicing. They don't enjoy 
doing the things that will allow them to grow faster. That's totally fine. But unfortunately, we have to be honest and face the reality. Uh, such people will never really grow as musicians. And that's totally fine because, like I said, if they're just happy grabbing the instrument and just doing, you know, and that brings them joy, that's beautiful. Let it be. But then, if your goal is to jam with people, and especially better musicians, then, of course, there are things you need to be able to do. There's just no other way about it. Unless, of course, you're super rich and you can pay people to come hang out with you. <laughs> so the biggest difficulty is to find this, uh, to find this common ground where joy meets the habit that promote growth. All the top players that I mentioned earlier have this uh, habit already where their natural habits coincide with the joy of making music. And that's why I think they were able to reach a very high level very fast and early on. Live the life. One of my absolute favorite musicians is a guitarist by the name of Rocky Gresset. And just in case you don't know him, let me just post this video here. This is someone who has absorbed two languages, two musical languages, the bebop language of West Montgomery and also Django style. And let's listen to play Django style. He's going to play over a blues. We just heard him play over a blues, like kind of like a bebop style with a lot of West influence. Now let's listen to play over a blues, Django style. <laughs>
He is someone who has never worked with a metronome in his life. He has never worked on technique in the sense that he has never ever given any thought whatsoever uh, about his you know, right hand picking technique. He just did whatever felt most natural to him in order to get the sound that he heard in his head. Doesn't know anything about sweep picking, about downstrokes or upstrokes. He just, his hand just naturally does whatever it needs to do. He has no knowledge of theory doesn't know what a pentatonic scale is, doesn't even know what an E minor chord is, but you just heard him play some nasty blues there. I'm using him as an example because his natural habits are already in line with natural growth. Maybe this is what we can call talent. But make no mistake, he did spend his entire youth playing guitar relentlessly. Um, he didn't have prodigi prodigious technique or time fill from the start. But it's just that his natural habits developed into what they are, they are today automatically without giving anything much thought. It just happened. Pat Martino told me, a, told me a story about when he was young. And he went to take lessons with a guitar player, Dennis Sandoli, who was a famous teacher back in the day. Uh, he was also giving lessons to uh, John Coltrane apparently. Anyway, uh, Pat Martino was taking guitar lessons with Dennis. And for some reason, Dennis wanted Pat to change his guitar technique. Uh, Pat's technique, natural technique, is something like this, where he plants his hand against the bridge and he alternate picks. And Dennis wanted him to have a floating hand technique because that's how most old guitar players were playing in those days. I guess that would be in the 50s or 60s. Um, so yeah, that's what Dennis wanted Pat to do. And this old technique, I made a video about it on my YouTube channel. I forgot what it's called, like uh, gypsy guitar technique or old guitar. Look it up. It's one of my first videos. Anyway, um, Pat told me that he tried to do as Dennis told him to do, but he felt so frustrated about it. Eventually, he went back to his natural path, which is the technique that he has now, which actually happens to be very good technique, and it happens to be the modern electric guitar technique. So Pat avoided frustration just by following his own natural path. Luckily, his natural path was a good one. Now let's take an extreme example. Let's say your goal is to play this line with the same sound that I have. Let me see, what phrase can I play? There. Notice I have a very strong attack. Notice that the strings, when the way I play, since I'm not resting my hand here, the strings can resonate. So you have this uh, beautiful resonance coming from the guitar. But now let's assume that your technique, your natural technique is like this. I hold the pick like this, and I put my hand here, and I pick very... Totally different sound, right? Like very stiff. That's like extreme example. Now, if you were to play this way with this technique, I'm sure eventually you'll be able to reach some form of uh, competency, even though it's super unorthodox. But one thing is for sure, you'll never be able to come close to the sound and tone that I have because it's a result of the technique that I use. You won't get anywhere close or nowhere anywhere near as fast. If I played it... 
Yeah, I doubt you can do that with your arm that fast. Oops. No matter what technique you have, with a lot of practice, a lot of time, you'll definitely reach some level of competency. And there's a lot of lot, many examples of proof for this uh, out there. There are people out there playing violin with a prosthetic arm, and they manage to play. They don't have the best tone, but they can play music. There are people who have had their arms amputated or don't have arms and they play guitar with their feet and they actually manage to do some really good music. I highly doubt they'll ever be able to play like the technical music of Paul Gilbert or Yngwie Malmsteen, but they can play music. If your goal is to play what I just played, the way I played it, then no, then you'll have to do whatever it takes to be able to do that. Then you'll have to obviously change certain things. In order to get this sound, you need the guitar to resonate. So you must not your plant any part of your hand against the strings. You want the strings to resonate freely. As opposed to... Here only this E string is resonating. With this, all the other strings are resonating. You want to have a strong accented attack. And if you play super quietly, if you're used to playing super quietly, you'll never have this strong attack. And then if you want to play it as fast, then you need to activate some sort of wrist movement. If you're using a lot of arm, it's very difficult. All this would be completely unnatural to you. It's not in line with your natural path, but it can be learned. Now the question is, are you willing to put in all the, the time and the work, uh, or will you feel discouraged and frustrated. The technique that Dennis Sandoli wanted Pat Martino to adopt was not an unorthodox technique. It was the standard technique of the old days. And it's every bit as valid as Pat's uh, current technique. But they're actual, they're different techniques with their pr own pros and cons. Dennis probably wanted Pat to adopt his technique for dogmatic reasons. So I'm not a big fan of dogmatism. But the thing is, Pat felt this extreme frustration which led him to feel discouraged and just give up. It was not in line with his natural path and he realized, he decided not, I'd rather be happy. So if you want to play that line that I just played with the same sound that I have, then you do have to change and you have that weird technique where you're holding your pick like this and you're using your arm and you're stiff like that. that that's, that's your natural way of playing. Well, then you'll have to change it. But will you feel frustrated to achieve it? If so, then maybe you should just accept that the sound, that sound that I, for that line is not to be meant to be played uh, that way for you. And you will have to find something else to play or play it the way that you would want to play it with uh, your own sound. On the other hand, if you enjoy the challenge and you're willing to work on it, then yes, I guarantee you that uh, with perseverance and focused practicing, you can achieve it. The biggest difficulty is that unnatural feeling that you'll have in the beginning and it will take a lot of serious concentration to make sure that you're uh, forming the correct habits. Players like uh, Rocky Gresset never had that problem. It was just their technique was the right one from the get-go. And maybe you're the same as Rocky, in which case that's great. But if, if you're not, then you have to do this kind of focused practicing. Actually, it was the same for me. When I was younger, I had the same technique, the Pat Martino technique. And then when I discovered Django, I wanted to adopt the Dennis Sandoli thing, the, the floating hand. So there was like maybe a period of six months where I forced myself to change my technique. And then eventually it felt natural. So I'm actually, me and many other players are living proof that it's doable. People that have natural talent are of course very impressive and they deserve all the praise they get. But personally, I am much more inspired and impressed by people who don't fit in this category, but work extremely hard to overcome their weaknesses. And I want to give a shout out to my buddies, Zach Martel, who's, uh, who works with me at DC Music School, and my, my buddy, Will Dickerson, who's the player that you heard at the beginning of this video, who, in my opinion, well, as far as people that I've met are concerned, they're, they are two of the most seriously dedicated uh, people that I've ever met. There are people who don't necessarily have uh, this extreme natural path that Birelli Lagren had. And keep in mind that this this is actually a wide spectrum. It's just not it's not a X Y thing. 
but these are people who have the love such an intense love for music and the desire to overcome weaknesses it's like Son Goku and Vegeta in Dragon Ball Z Goku is just naturally ta talented Vegeta also has talent but he had to work much harder to catch up to Goku well I really respect Vegeta or Naruto you know Sasuke just has a natural Uchiha talent but Naruto had to work really 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 hard just to catch up to his friend he would practice 10 hours a day all like every day just to just to catch up to Sasuke so I'm really in tremendous awe of these kinds of people to me that's that's their talent the talent of perseverance and hard work I know that in a workshop once Moses Rosenberg advised against using a metronome and he said that he never used it and now here's the thing his sense of time is naturally really solid he had that natural path where he naturally developed a very natural sense of time if you have that sense sense of time same sense of time then yes you don't need a metronome but then if you don't and you want to improve it then it's quite likely that you'll have to do some kind of training that might involve involve the metronome so it's the same thing are you gonna find joy in doing this kind of work it can take weeks if not months if not even a few years to to correct because here we are training ourselves to make the unnatural feel natural if you watched my video on YouTube about how gypsy musicians learn I talk a lot about this natural path because 99% of the players in the Manush gypsy community follow their this natural path that's just the way they learn traditionally I'm actually in this whatsapp group of uh, French Manouche players and because they're all they're all quarantined not quarantined but like in isolation because of the pandemic and they're they got bored so they created this whatsapp group called like the daily Django challenge so you have all the Reinhardt family David Reinhardt, Django's grandson and all these other players they're in it some of them are professional musicians some of them are, are hobbyists anyway the idea is that someone suggests a Django phrase to learn and everyone has to play it so this one guy was feeling a bit sad because he didn't he never learned to play with a pick he played with his fingers but everyone in the group just told him didn't matter just play the way you feel like playing that's the natural path when the natural path is in tune with the path that allows you to grow it's great it's the very best these are the players that became that become Birelli Legrand, Angelo Debar, Rocky Grisset, Kanye West you know but believe me when I say that there are many players in that community who do who reach a plateau early on because some of their natural paths didn't line up with the correct natural path and unfortunately such people never progress beyond their current level because of this in their community it's very common to be self-taught but I I'm sure that if they had some some outside help then they could easily catch up or at least raise their skill levels to something much better than their current situation barring some kind of learning disability or something I think we all have the potential to improve our situation your technique can always be improved your always can always your ear sorry can always be improved and your time feel can always be improved the key then is how do you get this joy in practicing and this desire and motivation to work to achieve your goals so as I said early on before you even get there you have to realize what it is that you need to be working on again guys like Birelli and Rocky knew from the get-go what they want to do and they knew they heard in their ears how they want to sound and they naturally developed this technique and sound because they're they were just in tune with that natural path that's often a lot of reasons why some of these players told me they never practice when in fact they actually did that for them practicing was playing they were having fun on the other hand some people might not necessarily know how bad their sense of time is because they don't pay attention they can't hear it or no no good musician has ever told them and I think this actually might be the situation here in Taiwan where rhythm sections like bass players and drummers are struggling really really hard with their time feel and um, in, in Taiwan the tempo is dragging so much it's like this intense intense drag and 
it's actually really quite bad that in Taiwan there are some good drummers and good bass players but like most of them are suffering from very 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 bad time feel and I don't know if they're aware hopefully they watch this I don't mean this in a in a, in a mean way but um, I think if they really want to improve then they should be aware of this and actually I had problem with uh, time feel uh, when it came to rhythm playing and soloing as well, but soloing and rhythm playing are two different uh, worlds. Let me just talk about rhythm playing now. Um, I remember in 2005, the summer of 2005, I got hired by my idol at the time, uh, Ritari Gaganetti, a gypsy jazz player, a gypsy player from east of France. His usual rhythm player couldn't take time off from work to do a tour, so he asked me to do it because he knew that I was a big fan of his, and I was so honored that he would even consider me. Uh, so I had the sound. That's why he hired me. Like he knew that I had the sound. He knew that I worked hard. But when it came time to do the gigs, I was dragging so much. I do have an excuse though, because I was intensely jet lagged. And it did get better towards the end of the tour, he told me. But there was this dragging thing but I, here's the thing i didn't even know that i was dragging i didn't feel that i was dragging i had no idea i can only believe them so this awakened something in me said oh man i really i really need to work on my time feel if i'm dragging I, I wasn't aware and i need to become aware so i started practicing really hard to like i tried to compensate by making my hands go faster and just a few weeks later i met up with paulus schaefer a dutch gypsy guitar player and he told me that I was speeding up too much. So then, whoa, that awakened another thing. Okay, well, now I'm no longer slowing down. I'm speeding up. So I need to like work on this groove. So then I went back home to Canada, turned on the metronome, practice along with play along. I really spent night and day thinking about timing, about groove. And I think now I've got it. I think I have a recording somewhere of Mike Stern telling me what an awesome groove I have. I gotta look it up. If I can find it, I'll post it right here. <laughs> and Dennis is another bad motherfucker, man. Beautiful time. He was playing Stevie Wonder, and then he turned around and played some Bach, and then he played some Gypsy. But uh, uh, accompaniment is something I, since that 2005 moment, it just triggered something in me that make, made me work really, really hard on accompaniment. And I love to play rhythm. All this to say that awareness is the first thing. It's the biggest thing. Because if you're not aware, you'll never work on it. Now you're aware. Two, what are you going to do about it? Do you have the drive to fix it? And if you have that drive, you will stop at nothing to achieve it. Often when we have the awareness, but we don't have the drive, it's often because of fear and pride. Pride because we've already achieved a high level in, on our instrument. For example, in 2005, when I was, um, that by that time I've been playing Gypsy Jazz for five years, and when I was hard to play rhythm, I had a really good sound. I had the sound, but I didn't have the time feel. And if I had this pride in my sound, and also this, f then, um, how do you say, if I have this fear and pride, that prevented me from practicing that I would never improve. Basically, it's this kind of frustrate, the psychological frustration that we feel w within us that, man, I spent so many hours getting this sound and now I have to work on my time feel, you know? Luckily, I said to myself, no, okay, you know what? I did spend hours and hours working on my sound. Now it's time to spend hours and hours working on my time feel too so that both can create a good groove. So it's often this ego thing that, that is our own enemy. So this next example I want to give you is in the jazz violin world, especially those who are classically trained, especially those with, uh, who have reached a very high level of classical uh, training, there's often a tremendous fear of harmony. Often the more technically advanced the violin is, the, the stronger that fear is. It goes back to that thing of pride and ego. It's a psychological thing. Because in tra traditional classical violin pedagogy, there, um, there's almost, there really is an emphasis on harmony. Some do learn it. And I can definitely name many, but the vast majority do not. 
These are people who practice relentlessly, who, I guess, suffered for their art to, to reach the technique that they have, but they never train harmony. So basically they have technique, skill level 100, harmony 0. And when, when they realize that if you want to play jazz, you have to have some level of harmonic knowledge. Uh, well, some of them, they will train it and become good jazz musicians. Others will live in their fear or pride and never work on it. And therefore, they never, in my opinion, become good jazz musicians. There is just no way about it. In order to play any kind of good jazz, there needs to be some level of understanding of harmony. The more your understanding of harmony, the more you can um, make something special. For me, harmony doesn't mean like complicated theory or anything like that. It's just the ability to recognize that there's, there are chords to a song and that you have the ability to play music that is in line with the harmony, outline, playing the changes, so to speak. Because if you don't, you're basically leaving your playing to complete chance and can only react to what you hear. hear sorry. Even if you have the very best ears on the planet, it's still not sufficient because part of being a good jazz musician is uh, knowing in advance what you're going to play. You can hear like a few seconds, a few chords in advance. And if you don't even know what the chords are going to be, then basically you can only play reactively. So that affects your phrasing already. Let's pretend I'm giving a speech or we're having a conversation. Um, knowing the chords to a song is like knowing the topic. For the conversation let's say our conversation is the history of christianity okay i'm not the biggest expert but i do know something the more you study up on christianity the more you can say about it and if you study up on judaism then you have more to say even more to say but let's assume for a second that you're completely ignorant about christian you don't know anything about judaism you don't know anything about christianity you don't know anything about jesus so you show up to the discussion this uh, discussion and you start saying, you give this like 10 minute speech devoid of any useful content. You're like, you're saying, yeah, you know, uh, Christianity, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Some people love it. Some people are against it, you know. But the people who love it, you know, they're, they're really happy. It brings great joy to their hearts. It's like very important to them, you know. It's like they can't, they can't imagine life without it. And it's such a great thing. And Christianity is like so cool. So basically I just rambled for 30 seconds and basically said nothing. Absolutely nothing about Christianity. You can replace the word Christianity with chocolate, with cigarettes, with jazz, anything. It will be still the same, conver it was the same drivel that I just spouted. To me, that's what it's like when I hear uh, a jazz musician that doesn't have those skills. And often that's jazz violinists or jazz vocalists who try to scat, they, it's random, random content. And some people actually applaud these players or they enjoy it because of the psychological factor of the way that they deliver their speech. If someone plays like the most, uh, how do you say, the most uh, meaningless thing on the violin but plays with so much passion, good vibrato, good sound, good rhythm, and like the same thing with a jazz vocalist. The, a jazz vocalist is getting a solo, but like good rhythm, good pitch, good uh, tone, but the actual solo has absolutely nothing to do with the song. People will often rea react to that more than they will to the actual lines. That is because people are, psychologically, we are more, we tend to listen more to the, the delivery than the actual content. That's why some politicians who say the most stupid things can get a crowd riled up because they speak with passion. Uh, that said, in my opinion, if you want to be a good musician, a good jazz musician, you want to have that passion, that delivery, but you also want to have good content. And to truly appreciate this content, then you have to have, uh, then you have to develop some kind of uh, skills for lis listening skills to listen to the lines. Again, all of this is awareness. Are you aware that you have this deficiency? If so, are you willing to work to fix it? Personally, I'm very aware of all my flaws. Some I do address more than others. And sometimes it's not 
because of fear, because I feel that certain things that, uh, that could be improved, I don't improve just because uh, I don't feel it's as important. For example, I'm not a good singer at all. Um, because people say that you should be able to sing your jazz lines. I, I, I'd rather make a modified version of that statement. You should be able to hear your jazz lines. Because singing is actually it's like an instrument. And I have very limited range. And I don't train it enough to really sing with pinpoint accuracy. I don't mind. Maybe one day I will address that issue. But for me, like right now, it's, it's fine. And I can prove that I can hear what I want to play in advance. Because if you let me do it slowly enough, then I can sing. Like, you know. It's not in tune, but I, I hear it. Okay, so I definitely can hear. For me, that's, that's good enough. That's why I never really developed the singing aspect. But yeah, in the day, back in the day, so there was this huge problem with rhythm for accompaniment. And then there was the problem of rhythm uh, when it came to lead playing. That's another topic. So uh, I addressed the issue of rhythm for accompaniment. And I've addressed the issue for rhythm timing for lead playing. And I'm still addressing it because it's still very difficult. It's something that all of us many of us struggle with i don't let fear get in the way i i make a judgment i don't work on the singing because i just don't feel it's necessary for, necessary for what i want to do so all this talk about joy natural path and motivation this video is for those of you who want to be to improve but may not be living this natural path again it's a spectrum in my case I had a nat natural path towards developing a solid sense of harmony because I've always thought in terms of chords. Uh, same thing for technique. I did go through a period where I had to change my technique, but after a few months, it just became very natural. And my technique developed on its own without giving it too much thought. Um, same thing with ear training. Um, I, I got in the habit of transcribing very, very early on. It's like part of my daily life, always training my ears. So now it, it's very easy for me to learn songs or transcribe. Let me just summarize things, uh, the key points. The key point in this video is that I'm assuming that you are not in line with a natural path for growth. This means, unfortunately, that you do have to do extra work than those who are in line with the natural path. Keeping in mind it's a wide spectrum, we are rarely ever at the very bottom rank for everything. Like so I've met people who, were, who had good ears, they learned very quickly, but they, had, they struggled with technique. And I've met people the other way around, the amazing technique, but couldn't, didn't have good ears or couldn't learn songs quickly enough. So everyone has, it's a wide range of skills. Understanding why you play music and why, what is your purpose for practicing. The more precise you can be with the answer, the easier it is to figure out what to practice and be efficient with it. Already saying that you love gypsy jazz, that's a good start. But it's not enough. Because gypsy jazz can be played in so many different ways. You then have to focus on what you love about gypsy jazz. Maybe you like Stokola Rosenberg, and therefore you're going to try to do everything you can to learn from Stokola Rosenberg. And then maybe like two or three players. Okay, that's fine. Take two from two or three players and you'll end up with your own style. Maybe you don't like gypsy jazz. Maybe you only like Django. Maybe you only like Django from the 1930s. And you also like Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet. And that's the case of my buddy uh, Duvet Donoyevsky. He focused strictly on that aspect of uh, Django's playing. I wouldn't even call that gypsy jazz, but hot jazz or trad jazz. And let's just watch a video of Duvet's playing.
So you see, the more precise you can be with your wants, your desires, the easier it is to know what to practice. And that will be going towards already a natural path of what to practice because that's the stuff that brings you joy. I got to say that when in my 20s, I struggled a little bit with depression because I was always comparing myself with what other people keep in mind that in, in, in my 20s, I was pretty much the only gypsy jazz player in my town. No one was playing. And when I was going to uh, meeting up with like people going to music school, they or even the teachers, like they talked very like, uh, how do you say they bad mouth Django Reinhardt because it wasn't it was too simple harmonically and all that stuff. So I, I struggled with that. That's why I say this joy thing is important and you have to forget about other people. Focus only on yourself about what you like. If you love modern jazz, go for that. Don't let your joy be dictated by other people's joys. Anyway, within this category of growth that I mentioned, you have the issues of listening skills, timing, harmony, and that stuff. But then there's also the issue of mechanical growth. And that's technique, dexterity, and sound, but also timing and rhythm. Rhythm falls under both categories of stylistic and mechanical growth because being able to play fast and even with a good sound but not being able to lock it in time means poor mechanical technique. But stylistic as well because certain styles of playing favor a particular sense of style like a sense of time. Certain styles are more locked in, certain styles are more relaxed, certain styles are more ahead. So that's the interpretive side of, uh, of technique. And as I said, technique itself also falls under stylistic growth because certain styles of music demand a certain sound that can only be achieved with a certain technique. For example, I gave the example of jazz violins. A lot of people, a lot of jazz violinists come from classical violin and they often have a solid background in classical violin. So the mechanical growth thing is usually minimal. They have to focus more on the stylistic growth side of things. On the other hand, if you're starting violin and you also want to learn like the instrument, but you also want to learn jazz on, you have two things to work on, mechanical growth and stylistic growth. But anyway, we'll talk about more about technique and uh, mechanical growth and uh, stylistic growth in another video. The main point I want to make is that you can get better in all of these categories, but you have to be aware of what your flaws are. Then you have to find the motives, motivation and the sincere desire to overcome such flaws. You are basically your own biggest obstacle. And if you never find this motivation, then I, find, I suggest that you find, you do whatever you can to convince yourself to be happy just the way you are and accept the consequences of being just the way you are. It's totally fine. For instance, if I had never developed my rhythm guitar playing, then I would never have played rhythm for Bire Legrand, Angelo Levar, all these players. That is, uh, so if I had never worked that, then it's a consequence that I would have to accept. And the worse my rhythm playing is, the less likely anyone is going to invite me for a jam. You have to accept these consequences. I've met people who had no sense of structure or even tonality in jazz. And they go to a jam session and play their solo on like all of me and stop like uh, at uh, the, the sixth measure and pass on to the, the soul to the next person. Such people I say, no great, they did their thing, you know, they're beginners, whatever. But I guarantee you the consequence of being stuck at that level is no one's ever gonna hire you, no one's gonna, no serious musician will ever invite you to jam. And if you go every week, they'll try to limit your particip participation as much as possible. You know, they're not trying to be mean, but this is the level that you have, how can you participate if you don't have a minimal skill level so accept this and be and ac be happy with the way you are and accept the consequences i don't know how to give this uh joy or motivation to people uh, the motivation somehow has to come from within and some e some people even try to go to music school to find this motivation some do find it it's this magical spark that's mysterious i do have one friend who wanted to learn jazz and she knew the tunes, um, but just the melodies, but she also wanted to learn how to scat. And she has this confidence issue that she wasn't taken seriously as a jazz musician because she didn't really understand how jazz worked.
So she went to music school. She went to music school and still hasn't found that thing, that spark. But I did tell her how to get to reach the level she wanted to reach. It's about that lifestyle. So are you going to accept that you have to do this kind of work to reach the level? Going to music school is not going to solve that for you. Only you can solve that for yourself. And if you don't do it, then that's a sign that you're not 100% serious about it. You know, all of us, we can say, if I ask you, hey, do you want a million dollars? Of course, all of us will say yes. But then, okay, well, then first you need to go to school for and study like five hours a day and blah, blah, blah. Then many of us will suddenly, I was like, ah, screw it, right? It's the same. I know people whose life, when they were kids, their dream was to be rich. And they did, you know, they were, they did whatever it took to reach their goals. And they did. They went to school, they studied finance, they studied like the stock market, they became investors, and they invested in construction, things like that, and became millionaires. That was their goal. So it's one thing to want something like casually. Yeah, I, I would love to have 10 guitars, 10 beautiful guitars. Uh, and I could, I would just have to probably quit music, find another line of job that allowed me to buy like 10 guitars. But then there's wanting something and you'll stop at nothing to get it. And that's what I'm talking about. So I don't know how to give you this inspiration. The only thing I can say is that I guarantee you 100% that if you're truly willing to put in the work, then yes, you can really improve your situation. Remember that you are you. You don't have to feel discouraged by people who don't have your flaws. Don't be discouraged by them. Find inspiration from people who are better than you. Remember, it's only music. The chances are you're most likely better than them at something else. You'd be cooking, sports. And I'm really, I'm here to tell you that you can do it if you believe in yourself. You know, if you believe in yourself, I myself be will believe in you. And if we're ever to meet and you want some advice, I would happily help you out if I had the time. Try to adopt a positive attitude and then don't let fear get in the way of improving your situation. I never ever want to hear people say things like, oh, I'm not good enough or talented enough. I really, really hate hearing that. It's like when I was playing rhythm for retiring, I was slowing down. I didn't say, oh, I'm not good enough. No, I went home and I practiced, practiced, practiced to overcome that weakness. Today, you may have realized that you didn't play so well, but you know what? It's okay. You, you work on it. If you do nothing about it, it's going to be the same thing the next gig. And it's unfortunate because the people that I've met, you know, that I worked with, and they said, oh, I'm not good enough. And they keep saying that year after year. And then, well, at one point I stopped hiring them because they didn't do anything about it. It's just unfortunate. I would love to hire people like that I like, but they have to help themselves before I can help them. That's why I love like I, I have so much respect for Zach Martel and uh, and uh, Will Dickerson. Zach Martel is the rhythm guitar player in that Duvet Duvet album, and he did such a good job. Like he 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 worked his like his butt off to be able to deliver the content. Such people really inspire me. Now, of course, you also have to find the time to practice, which not everyone has. We'll have to talk about time management in a different video because I feel this video is already very very long. But hopefully what I said in this video resonates with you and gives you uh, a little bit of motivation to work hard. Man, you can do it. Ignore the naysayers. I know there are a lot of naysayers, a lot of gatekeepers who will, for some reason, it's, it, they get a kick out of putting you down. Ignore them. I'm telling you, you can do it. And I know so because I've met so many people over the years who have overcome their, their weaknesses. And now that's why I want to talk to you about Will Dickerson. He's the, he's the young fellow that you saw at the beginning of this video playing that amazing solo, in my opinion anyway. Um, he is someone that I met randomly in a park in Montreal. He told me that he loved Django Reinhardt and was trying to learn on his own. And uh, he had learned like one or two solos from the Rosenberg Academy, like Stokel Rosenberg thing, that's Christian van Hamert's thing. And he played that solo no for no, but he didn't know how to improvise and didn't really understand how to play rhythm in, in this style. Not only did he know nothing about jazz, didn't know what a 251 was, uh, he didn't really know how to improvise beyond simple Stevie Ray Vaughan licks that he learned as a kid. And that's it, that was all he could do. So I said, 
you know, okay, like, uh, I'll help you out. What we'll do is we'll for focus on learning songs first. I'll teach you a bunch of songs. So I had him pull out his camera, his phone, and I, play, I showed him the chords to a bunch of songs. Like, I don't know, 20 songs. And the next week, he had memorized the whole, all the songs. He didn't understand how they work, but he memorized what I told him to memorize. He learned the tunes. I like, wow, cool. Hey, let's get together every day, play rhythm for me, and let's do a gig. And so we did a gig. He did a really, really good job. He was nervous, but he worked. He worked. He practiced. And I remember, like, he had to, I had to teach him the songs this way with him recording because I couldn't show him a song. He didn't, he couldn't learn them fast enough. But eventually I told him, like, little things to how to think about songs so that you can recognize certain patterns. Now, if you see him play, um, not that if, if you meet him, if you were to teach him a song, he would learn it really quickly. He understands because he's learned so many songs, he knows how the grammar of the music works. And then for lead playing, I just had him focus a lot on developing lines, developing vocabulary, and that's all he does. Like, uh, and keep in mind, Will Dickerson is not a full time musician. When I met him, he was a student in engineering, then he was doing a master's in engineering and also working like full time in a lab. He would get up every morning like at 5 or 6 a.m. to pack, practice two or three hours. Then when he came home, practice another hour. That's like intense, intense dedication like I've never seen. And he still keeps up this habit. He has a job here somewhere in Texas doing engineering, but gets up early in the morning to practice. And look at this. Look at it. Watch that video again. Keep in mind that I think five, five, yeah, five years ago, is it five or six years ago, he knew nothing about jazz, like nothing. He lives the life and you can too.